Hello, my name is Low G, and welcome to another edition of Low G Tracks. In today's track, we will continue talking about what I call setup chords, but instead of thinking about just a single setup chord, we will use multiple setup chords, essentially giving us a setup progression. Let's first check out what the associated backing track sounds like. If you don't know what I mean when I say setup chords, I highly recommend you watch the first lesson that I did on this topic, which you can find at the link above. And if you'd rather not hear me talk about anything for 30 minutes, feel free to jump right to the track in the link in the description. And as usual, if you enjoy this type of instructional material, check out my Patreon at the other link in the description. Now let's get on to the lesson. Okay, so all we're really doing here in this concept is taking what we talked about in the past, which was the five of idea where we have a target chord and we set it up with a dominant seventh built off of its five. And we're just adding in another chord to that mix. So instead of just five of the target chord, we're going to do something five of the target chord. And the way that we find what that something is, is by simply looking in the key where that five to one exists, right? So let's say we're doing a target chord of D and we're setting it up with its five, which would be A7. So here's D and then A7. Right? So if we want to find another chord that we can throw in there, all we need to do is say, all right, well, what other chords exist in that kind of temporary key that we're in? So we're, te we're pretty much in the key of D right there, regardless of if the song we're playing or the part that we're playing is in the key of D. Because we're doing this setup, we are temporarily thinking about just this moment as the key of D, right? So we have D is our target. It's five. A7 will be the setup. So what are some other chords we can play? We can play four, right? That would be G. So we could play like a four, five of D. That would be a longer setup, like a setup progression. We can also play like six, five to D. So that would be B minor to A to D, right? That's a six, five. Those are possible. We're going to talk about by far the most common one that you will hear of all styles of music, and that is a two to a five to a one. So if we're uh, targeting D, D is our target chord, instead of just playing the five of, which is A, seven to D, we're going to play the two five of, which would be what? Two chords, really easy to find. If D is our target, two is simply up a whole step, minor. That's it, right? Super easy to find. So D is the target, up a whole step minor. In this case, that would be E minor. So instead of just the five of D, which would be A7 to D, we now have the two five of D, which would be E minor, A7 to D. That's straight up it. That's the whole idea. And you can do this whenever you are moving to any major chord. So I'm going to demonstrate by playing two major chords, and I'm going to do different types of setups into each one. So the two chords I'm going to play are going to be D is my first target chord. G is going to be in my next target chord. Right? So D, G, that's it. So if I play D and G just by itself, sounds like this. So D, right? Something really simple. G. G add nine, whatever, who cares? And then back to D, right? So now that's the straight up just target chord to target chord. I'm going to set up each chord with just the five of each, right? So that would be D is the target, normal target. Then D7 will be the five of G. And then A7 will be the five of D, right? So we're setting up each chord before I hit it. So that would be D, five of G, G, 5 of D, A7, maybe A sus, we talked about that, right? And then finally D. 
Cool. So now that's the five of each chord. Now I'm going to do the two five of each chord, and you can hear the difference. So the two five of each chord is going to look like this. We're going to start on D. Then we're going to play the two five of G, which will be what? If G is our target, we already know what five is. It's D7, right? Just simply up a power chord like we talked about last time. And the two is really easy to find as well. Remember, up a whole step minor. So if our target is G, up a whole step is A minor. That's what we play. So let's do that whole thing. And then, of course, getting back to D, the, the second target chord, it's 2-5 is up a whole step minor. So E minor, then the 5, A7, and then D. So let's see what that whole thing sounds like. D, right? 2-5 of G. G. 2-5 of D. Right? Do it again. Not talking. Right? Notice it's not that different than just the plain five of. I mean, it is different because we have like a minor chord happening in there now that we didn't before, but the, the general flow is still pretty much the same. It's just more, there's just more stuff, right? It's more mobile. It's more, there has more, mo or there's more motion as we're moving all through the chords because there are just simply more chords that we're playing. But the general sound is pretty similar. So. It's pretty much the whole idea, right? It's really simple. We're just adding in more sounds to make sure that that setup is extra strong, right? Now, of course, keep in mind, I'm adding chords, but I'm not adding time into the music, right? If I was taking a bar to play just the five of earlier, right? I'm not just adding another bar because now I have another chord. I'm now playing two chords within that same time period to make sure that the progression is still the same length. That's really important to do. Now, if you're writing or creating, you can honestly do whatever you want. But if you are trying to stick to a really rigid formula of D for two bars, then G for two bars, and you start adding in setup chords, you need to make sure that you're not adding in time, right? We're just replacing time with these setup sounds, depending on what we're doing. So always keep that in mind, super important. So notice also what we're doing here. We are setting up a major chord, okay? This is 2-5 of major. If we were to do a, uh, uh, have a target chord of a minor chord, like 2-5 of minor, it would not necessarily be exactly like this. So let me just demonstrate what I mean by that. So if I'm playing D, and then I want to go to B minor, right? So B minor would be here, the sixth chord. We know that we can play the 5 of 6, and that works perfectly. So D, 5 of 6, right? To B minor, the 6. We know that works, but if we try to play a 2-5 of that, that would look like this in regards to what we just talked about. That would be D major, and then what's the 2 of B? So here's the B. 2 is here, minor, right? 2 chord minor, then 5 chord dominant, and then finally the, the minor chord that we're going for, the 6 chord. It doesn't necessarily sound bad. I'll play it one more time. So D, 2, 5 of B minor, right? doesn't necessarily sound bad, but there is another option that is way more common and way more popular, which we'll talk about down the road. Not really going to talk about it today, but we will definitely down the road. For now, let's just focus on the two fives of major because they're pretty much always going to be like this. The two is minor, the five is dominant, and then we hit our target chord, which is major. So with all of that in mind, let's move on to the track and go over exactly how the track is moving and what we can do while we're playing over it. All right, so this track is really simple. It's exactly the same as the previous one where we were playing five ofs every major chord. So that looks something like this. We played a major chord, A, for instance, that turned into the five of the next chord, so A7, which moved to D. And then that chord turned into the five of the next chord, so D7, which moved to G. And then that chord turned into the five of the next chord, which is G7, which moves to C, et cetera. That's how the entire track moved. We're doing the exact same thing, except instead of just the five of, we're doing the two five of. So if we have A and we're about to move to D, instead of just playing A7, which would be just the five, we're going to play E minor A7, the two five, and then D. And then in, as we move to G, we'll play G's 2-5, which is A minor, D7, 2-5, and then G. And then as we move to the next target chord, which is C, we'll play its 2-5, which is D minor, G, and then C, et cetera. That's how the whole thing is going to go. And all the chords will flash up in front of you on the screen so you can just follow them like usual. So in regards to playing over this, playing leads or melodies, there are a bunch of things we can do. We're going to go over a couple options today that have to do with how related the two and the five chord actually are. Um, but the first one is probably the most important one and the most blatant one, and that's just simply play the chords as they show up on the screen. 
right? So if it's a two chord, let's say we're targeting D, right? So here's our one chord D. If we, if the music is playing the two five and it hits the two, just straight up play the two. What is the two? E minor. So just play whatever you would normally do over a two chord, right? So what are the notes we have available always over a two chord? Just a standard minor two chord. One, two, flat three, four, five, natural six, flat seven, one. Straight up minor with a natural six. Right, super, super common, very normal sound. So when the E minor happens, you could just straight up play that, right? Exactly what you would normally do over a two chord. And then when the five chord comes, it's dominant seventh, so you would just play what you would normally play over a five chord. So it's major, straight up, one, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven. That's the different note for a five chord, dominant seventh has the flat seven. So E minor comes, just play E minor. And then when A7 comes, Right, play A7, and then when D finally happens, the target, resolve to D, do whatever you want to do. Um, that's option number one. And that's, gonna, like I said, going to be the most blatant, the most obvious option. I'm just going to play that a little bit just so you can see kind of what that sounds like. Like I said, it's pretty straightforward. Um, sounds like this. So here's the track, just those, those changes. E minor. A7. Right. I'll do it one more time. E minor up top. A7. D. Right? That's the most blatant choice that you can do. Just straight up play the chords as they happen. There's nothing wrong with that. And to be honest, it's probably the best one to practice because it really requires you to actually think about what you're doing. You can't really autopilot too much while you're thinking about each individual chord because you have to know what chord you're on at that moment and play that chord and then know what the next chord is and be able to seamlessly move into that next chord, play that, and then continue going. So that's probably the most uh, mentally intensive option, but it's also a really good one to be able to do because you can pretty much play over any chord change if that's how you're thinking. And I personally think that's the best way to think, et cetera, et cetera. However, there are some other choices that we can make that are actually a little bit easier, but they still work and they still give us some cool options that we can play. So what this is, we need to look at the relationship between the two five that we're playing, right? So if we're playing uh, in the key or not necessarily in the key of D, but if we're targeting a D, right? The two five that we just did, E minor, A7, right? That's the two five. Let's look at how those notes of each chord, the notes of A7, how those notes function over an E minor chord, because they're actually going to be a lot more similar than you might imagine. So what are the notes of just a plain A dominant seven? So one, three, five, flat seven, that's the formula, right? So those notes are A is the one, C sharp is the three, E is the five, and then G, natural, is the flat seven. Okay, so that's one, three, five, flat seven of A. A, C sharp, E, and then G. Cool. What are those notes over E minor? How do those notes function over E minor? So let's look at all of those notes and what they are of E minor. So here's E minor, right? A was the root of the dominant seventh, or the root of the A7, I should say. What is that in relation to E? That's E's four. Okay, cool. Keep that in mind. What about A's third, the C sharp? That is E's flat, or excuse me, natural six, right? We talked about that being a note that you can play over the two chord. Okay, what about A's five? A's five is E, what is that over E minor? The root, right? The, the root of the chord, pretty simple. And then what's A's flat seven, which was G, what is that over E minor? That's the flat three. So think about the notes that we have. Obviously, the A is the four and the C sharp is the, the natural six. So you might say, okay, those aren't really in the chord. You know, I'll put those off to the side. But look at A's five is the root of E minor. So the fifth of the five chord is the root of the two chord. So that's a pretty good connection right there. And then the flat seven of this five chord, the G, is the flat three of the two chord. Okay, so the A7 has a root and a flat three of the two chord. That's essentially like an E minor, like parts of an E minor, most of an E minor, I would say, 
living inside of the A7. So those chords kind of overlap. There pretty much is an E minor sound inside of A7. So what does that mean? That means that we can essentially play the A7 even though the E minor is happening, right? And why can we do that? Because two of the four notes of A7, the full uh, dominant seventh chord, are in the E minor chord, right? So they're, they're similar enough that we can just do that. And then the other notes, what were the other notes? The notes that weren't in the chord. The root of the dominant seventh, the A, that's the four of E minor. Four is not that weird of a note. It's in the pentatonic scale, right? There's E minor pentatonic. E pentatonic scale is one flat three four five flat seven. So four naturally exists in the simplest minor sound that we can play, pentatonic. So that's a safe note. Nothing wrong with that. And then the other note, the C sharp, the third of the A dominant seventh, that's the natural six of the E minor. Again, not a chord tone, not a super easy note to play or super normal sounding notes. It's one of the more dissonant notes, but it is that special color note of a two chord, right? The two chord, the color note, the unique note of a two chord is the natural six. It's the only minor chord that has a natural six in it, right? That naturally exists, I guess, in a key. So if we want to access that sound, right, we could just say, I'm just going to play a dominant seventh, even though I know the chord is E minor. So what does that mean we can do? The earlier option that I had suggested is just straight up play each chord as it happens. So when E minor happens, play E minor. When A7 happens, play A7. And then when D happens, play D. But we just figured out that A dominant seventh and E minor are kind of connected. So we can actually play over the E minor we can play A7, and then over the A7, we can continue to play A7. So it's almost like we know the chord progression is a 2-5, but we're just pretending that it's just a 5-1. Makes it a little bit easier to kind of mentally go about it, and it just will sound cool because you, you're going to be able to play dominant seventh ideas over a minor chord, which will just give you cool sounds, right? And we're targeting kind of these neat sounds like natural six and stuff. So I'm going to play that a little bit. I want you to see what that sounds like. So this, this is just going to be A7 the entire time until I hit the target chord D and then I'll move to D. So check out, check this out. Let me start this track over. Here we go. Just A7, right? Still A7. That's the D. A7 still. A7. Right? Pretty cool sound. It's definitely not like blatant E minor A7. It's, it has a different flavor, but it works in a really cool way. So what this means is whenever you are playing a 2-5, if you notice a 2-5 of, and they happen all the time. Like, you might naturally think, oh, this is a jazzy sound, so it only happens in jazz. Wrong. It happens all the time in all styles of music, straight up. You will hear it all the time. So if you notice it, you can look at that and say, oh, check it out. It's a 2-5. I know that I can, of course, play the 2 and then play the 5 in my lead, or I can just play the 5 over both because you know that it's going to function in a very similar way because those two chords are kind of living inside of each other, right? Really cool option. Well, guess what? If that way works playing the five throughout the entire thing, the opposite is going to work as well, playing the two the entire time. Why does that work? Because we just figured out that an E minor lives inside of an A7. Well, if that's true, the opposite is also true. Inside of an A or inside of an E minor lives an A7, right? Sort of. So let's see what the notes of E minor will be over an A dominant seventh, the opposite of what I just did earlier. So what are the notes of E minor? I'll do E minor seven, so make it a little bit fuller. So that would be one, flat three, five, flat seven. That's E, G, B, and D. What are those notes? in A or over an A dominant seventh. Let's see what happens. E, the root of E minor, is the five of A, chord tone to chord tone, right? The flat three of E minor is the flat seven of A dominant seventh, another chord tone to chord tone. That's that connection we found earlier, right? What are the other notes? The fifth of E, B, is the two of A dominant seventh, right? A, B, or A, B, the one to two. Two, very normal note over dominant seventh, especially moving to a major chord, right? How many times have you heard this chord? 
That's A dominant seventh with a two. That's literally all that is. If you ever see A nine or a nine chord, you are literally playing a dominant seventh with a two. So how many times do you see nine chords? All of the time. So that means two is a pretty normal note to play. So, so far, it looks pretty good for this E minor on top of the A7 thing, because all three of these notes function pretty well over an A dominant. What's the last note? E, G, B, D. So the flat seven of E is the four of A dominant seventh. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, right? The four of A dominant. So you might say, okay, four is not really, you know, it's not in the A pentatonic, it's not in the chord, so maybe that's a note that might clash a little bit. Technically, yes, but we talked about this note last time. This note is a super important sound if you're going for not just an A dominant sound, but an A suspended sound. Right? That's the core note that really gives you that suspended flavor. We take a dominant seven, get rid of the three, play a four instead. Sounds really awesome. And guess what? That sound is innately in the two chord, in E minor. So the cool thing is, if we play an E minor and someone plays an A in the bottom, together we are playing an A suspended chord. Because remember, E minor contains all of the notes of A suspended. Right? So what, are, what were the notes? Remember? E is the 5 of A, G is the flat 7 of A, B is the 2 of A, and then D is the 4 of A. That's literally like an A super suspended is what I call it. We have an A chord with a 2 and a 4. That's this kind of thing, right? Check this out. This is a literal E minor 7. 1, 3, 5, flat 7. If I play A on the bottom, like this, that's A suspended. So if we ever want to achieve that suspended sound, if you have a dominant 7th chord, right, like A7, and you want to play your lead in a way that makes this sound like a suspended, go to the two and play that straight up as though you, like any minor, any minor idea that you have, you can play that when you do it on top of the A7, it will sound like a suspended sound, right? So without getting further into any of the music jargon, the more of the story is this. Over a change like this, a 2-5, you can straight up play the two, E minor, and then you can straight up play the A7 in your lead, and then D. Or you can play A7 over both of the setup chords, over the E minor and the A7, like we talked about earlier, and then the D. Or you can play E minor, the two, over both of the setup chords. E minor, the two, over E minor, of course. And then continue to play E minor over the A7, which gives it that suspended sound. And then finally resolving to D. Let me play that one. You can see what that sounds like. Again, not necessarily going to be like perfect sound all the time. But if you do want that suspended sound, it's a really great one. This is just E minor the whole time. E minor still. And then finally D, of course, I'm resolving to D. E minor again. Okay, so notice that. I'm playing like the corniest E minor licks that I can think of, and it still sounds pretty good over this track because of the relationship between the two and the five. You can do that. Like you can literally just like play any blues licks that you you've ever played and just continue to play it even though the chord has changed to the five because you know it's going to function in a certain way, right? So many cool sounds. All right. The last thing, so that pretty much covers exactly what we want to talk about. The last thing that I think is really important that I want to touch on a little bit, and you can get some really cool sounds, is so, so far we've been pretty much thinking about what we can do over the two and the five. And we're kind of, the concept here is kind of like pretend chords, right? We talked, I've talked about that in the past. So instead of playing E minor A7, I can pretend it's just E minor the whole time, even though it's not, play E minor my lead. Or I can pretend that it's A7 the whole time, even though it's not, play A7 in my lead. But I haven't really done anything with this D. I've always just been playing the target chord just straight up how it is. But in the past, I've talked about pretend chords to major seven chords, right? So if this is our target chord, D major, normal, the main pretend chord that you can play for this, the chord that you can think about instead of this, even though this is actually happening, is up two whole steps, minor, so F sharp minor. So what does that mean? That means look at, look at all the options I have to mess around with different sounds. I can just straight up play the chords as I see them. I can play E minor when E minor happens. I can play A7 when it happens. I can play D when it happens. Or I can do something like this. 
I can see that it's E minor to A7 and then D, but I can play A7 the whole time. And then instead of resolving the D, I can resolve to F sharp minor, D major's pretend chord. So I can play A dominant, which will take me to F sharp minor. That's kind of interesting. Here's another one that's even more interesting and even easier to play. I'm going to pretend over the two and the five that it's E minor the whole time. We just talked about that, right? So even though it's E minor A7, I'm only going to play E minor in my lead the entire time. And then instead of resolving to D, I'm going to resolve to F sharp minor. Where would that be? Up a whole step. That's unbelievably easy to find, right? So if here I am playing whatever like corny E minor licks, whatever I'm playing, and if I want to resolve to D, I know that F sharp minor is a pretend chord. I can literally just do anything I'm doing, move it up two frets, and I've resolved perfectly, right? So check this out. This is one of my favorite things, because you can really get a lot of mileage out of some simple ideas. I'm going to play one lick. I'm going to do this. There's that over, the, over both chords, over E minor and A7. And when the D happens, I'm not going to move to D. I'm going to literally do the same thing up two frets, because now I'm on F sharp, the minor pretend chord of D. Watch how this sounds. E minor, literally going to do this lick, and that's it. Super exciting. Still doing it. Watch this. Up two frets. Right? Let's do it one more time. Maybe a little more exciting. Still doing it. Watch this. Right? I'm playing the same idea. You can literally do any lick. How about this? Super corny. How about this? Like, um, here we go. Sorry. Up two frets. And it still works because all of the notes I'm playing, they're still functioning in their own way over the chords. I'm playing E minor the whole time over the two and the five because I know I can do that. And then I'm playing F sharp minor instead of D because I know that works because that's a pretend chord. And the last fun thing you can do is this. Check this out. Same idea. Watch this. E minor, that same lick. Watch this. wow, what did I do? Some fancy jazz scale. That must have been something I did right there. I was probably doing calculus in my head when I came up with that lick. No, of course, all I'm doing is I'm just moving up a fret and playing the same exact lick. Why am I doing that? Because I know I'm going from here to here. It's up a whole step. Might as well throw in that one in the middle. Play that a little better. Right? It sounds real fancy. It sounds like I'm doing something real creative and fancy. I'm not. I'm literally just moving up a half step because I know I'm eventually going to resolve up a whole step. Might as well just hit those notes in between, right? If I'm going like... Literally any minor lick that you know, you can do that, and it works. Let's try that one I just played. So here we go. That one. Super corny. Again, am I doing complex mathematics in my head when I'm doing that? No, it sounds fancy, but all I'm doing is just moving up a fret because I know I'm eventually going to resolve at this F sharp minor. Why do I know the F sharp minor works? Because the actual chord is D major, and F sharp minor is just simply the pretend chord up two whole steps of that chord. And if you're not sure about that, I'll make sure to put a link up here of the lesson that I did on that concept because it's very, very easy and very useful. So. That's pretty much cover it. You can kind of see what's going on here. I'm, I'm thinking about a concept. This is the 2-5 idea. And then I'm just searching through all the sounds and seeing how can I like consolidate things to make it easier for me to play or just to give me more options. And again, if you have a lot of options, you're always going to be able to be more creative and have more things to play and always feel like you're not running out of ideas. So that's pretty much it. Hope all this stuff makes sense. Um, if you guys enjoy this type of instructional material, as usual, feel free to check out my Patreon at the link below, and I'll see you guys in the next one.